der Sinn ist, zum Schluss hat man eine Schallplatte. Davon muss man einfach ausgehen. Und eine Schallplatte muss irgendwann mal geschnitten werden mit so einer Maschine. Und dieser Weg, direkt durch das, ist wirklich direkt. Da ist ein Mikrofon, dann gibt es ein Kabel, das geht hier übers Dach, kommt hier an diesem Mischpult an und von dem Mischpult geht es hier auf diesen Schneidkopf. Und das ist direkt. Weil der Unterschied sonst ist, es geht irgendwie auf ein Band oder auf einen Computer, auf Festplatten, dann wird es kombiniert, geschnitten, neu gemischt, gemastert. Und diese ganzen Prozesse, die da dazwischen sind, die sagen wir einfach weg damit. It was maybe the most honest recorded sound I've heard of the orchestra. We found it a completely terrifying and satisfying experience in equal measures because we knew that our lives and our musicianship were on the line, but we felt whatever we said in that moment, that was going to be there. Morning, VC. In the fall of, uh, of this past year, 2016, the Berlin Philharmonic announced a release that kind of threw everyone for a loop. It definitely caught me way off guard. And I'm talking about their direct-to-disc box set of the Brahms symphonies. I'm sure most people in, uh, in the vinyl community are familiar with the direct-to-disc process, but what it is basically is it's a way of recording in an analog manner uh, directly to the lacquer, skipping the steps of recording to tape, mixing, mastering on tape, and feeding that tape to a, to a cutting lathe. Instead, the live sound is uh, sent right to the cutting lathe. It's gone through a mixing board, but the mixing is done live, and it's sent right to a cutting lathe. So it's um, a very direct way of making a vinyl, a vinyl record. Uh, Direct-to-disc cutting was popular in uh, the late 70s and 80s, in kind of a boutique audiophile sense. Uh, Sheffield Labs did a number of direct-to-disc cuttings as well as, as a couple of other companies. But they're very hard to do. Um, they're hard to do for a number of reasons. One main reason they are difficult is that um, the musicians get no chances at a redo. If they screw up, you gotta cut the whole lacquer again. Um, it's a very nerve-wracking process. Sometimes the performances wouldn't be as daring on direct-to-disc recordings because uh, the artists were under so much pressure. Also, they're very expensive to do. It's a very hard process that requires a lot of time and money. For the most part, direct-to-disc cuttings don't really exist today except for a couple boutique labels that will cut some small, some small ensemble jazz, uh, female vocalists, that kind of stuff. I see a lot of that in direct-to-disc. Sometimes I see some chamber music, you know, piano and violin, uh, piano and vocalist, things like that. I don't think they've done a substantial direct-to-disc orchestral recording in the last 20 years. I haven't heard of any. I'm sure there have been, but it's not something you see every day. So uh, I was pretty blown away when the Berlin Philharmonic announced they were doing a direct-to-disc cutting of the entire Brahms symphonies. First of all, you know, a major orchestra doing a vinyl release period is big news, let alone a vinyl release that isn't from digital. You know, the Berlin Phil have done a couple vinyl releases in the past, a couple vinyl box sets that were all cut from high res, you know, 9624 or 19224 digital files. And I'm sure those were quite good, but it, it kind of defeats the point of owning a vinyl record, in my opinion. I'm just going to get the download. It's a lot cheaper. And uh, and I think, you know, San Francisco did something similar with their Mahler cycle. They did, they did a, a vinyl record set pressed off the high res digital files, but um, for a much cheaper price, you could just go buy the SACDs, which sound phenomenal. So this is kind of the first of its kind that I have encountered. Um, you know, this was released this past fall, and it took forever to get a copy. Um, ordered it directly from Berlin. And there were a lot of problems getting it here. The first one showed up, and uh, the package was water damaged. So I had to send it back, and... Uh, and this is this probably didn't even arrive. I think we placed the order in November, and we finally didn't get a non-blemished copy until mm, February, March. So, uh, and of course, in that time, I've been finishing my degree and haven't had time to uh, come back here and open it. So I'm going to do an opening. I haven't seen any others on YouTube, so I'm going to do an opening unboxing 
whatever first examination of this, the complete Brahms symphonies conducted by Simon Rattle and the Berlin Philharmonic. A lot has been said about this set, but I haven't seen much about it on YouTube, so I think mine might be the first. This is numbered apparently out of, uh, I think about around 1800. It was, it was supposed to be, they were supposed to make as many copies as the year of Brahms' birth, which I'm blanking on at the moment. I want to say it was, he was born in the 1830s. Um, it's a shame that I don't know that off the top of my head. I, I feel I feel like a failure as a musician. Um, however, there's only 1,200 for the Western market. There's another couple hundred for the Japanese market. So mine is 789 out of 1,200. And of course, you know, 100 and something were given to the uh, the members of the Berlin Philharmonic. So let's uh, let's crack this open, shall we? I, I did take it out of the out of the shipping box because I wanted to make sure it was not damaged, but it is in perfect condition. So let's take off the cellophane. Um, I don't know if you can see it on camera, but I can already tell this is a this is one of those like textured boxes. Um, it's very beautiful, um, very very beautiful. So this backing sleeve comes off. It's just a just a plain backing. Oh, this is cool. The uh, the picture in the center here with uh, Sir Simon Rattle signing the lacquer is uh, is textured like a record. I mean, it feels grooved. This is cool. And of course, AA here for analog analog. It's not analog analog analog. It's not triple A because there's no master tape. Um, nice Berlin Philharmonic embossing here. This is, oh man, this is beautiful. Ooh. Okay. So I can show you this here, so I'm not doing everything off camera. Uh, it looks like there's a book at the top. It has a little uh, fabric string that you can pull to get everything out. So there's a book at top that's sealed. Let me uncrack this. I'm guessing this is program notes and ooh, easy there. I'm guessing this is program notes and uh, pictures and etc. Let's see here. Program notes in both English and German. Uh, just a, a quick paragraph about each symphony, maybe two paragraphs, and then photos from uh, what I think was a live recording. I believe this was this was made from live performances, as are most modern orchestral recordings. Um, I think one thing people don't realize now is that there's no money in record labels to do orchestral recordings. So... Most of the recordings you're, that are available now that were made in the last 10 years are live recordings because uh, they can't afford to pay the musicians to show up for just a recording session. They play a concert and they do a recording session during the concert. That's how it goes now. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think I can comment either way on whether or not that's a good or a bad thing. Um, sonically. But, uh... You know, there's something, there's something, uh, there's something you miss about, uh, you know, an orchestra that's showing up just to make a statement on a record rather than do another performance. Um, ooh, okay, a lot of detail about Brahms here. Um, some really nice. Uh, oh, this picture actually is is just uh, barely attached. Huh. I wonder why they did that. The paper's really thick. More pictures, I guess, that you can take out and uh, put where you like. Because, yeah, I think you can just remove these, it looks like. Okay, yeah, a lot of uh, big, just long, it's like an essay on Brahms here. Some shot of uh, Simon Rattle. Photos, are we going to see anything about the recording session here? 
Some shots of the score, which are nice. You know, this, this is the kind of presentation you usually don't get in uh, recordings of Brahms. This is the kind of presentation you would expect in like those early music recordings with historical instruments, you know, where they provide a big essay on why they're doing all these different things they're doing with this Bach cantata. That's what you expect this kind of stuff to show up in, not, not in, a, in a Brahms box set. Oh, and here is the woodwind section with uh, two of my favorite players. Emmanuel Paud on the flute and Albert Meyer on the oboe. These guys are masters. Um, I'm very happy they were playing on this recording because, as some of you know, um, the Berlin Philharmonic is such a large and frequently performing orchestra that many of the major uh, positions have co-principles. So there's a there's co-principal oboes. There's two principal oboes. Um, there's two principal flutes, and some will play some concerts and some will play the other. Um, the Met, the Metropolitan Opera has a similar thing because there's there's too many performances. You can't learn all the music. You can't be at all the rehearsals. So they split they split the principal position. So that's the book. I'm not gonna read this more. Uh, here's a certificate signed by Rainer Millard of uh, Emil Berliner Studios. Again, seven eighty nine out of twelve hundred. Let's see what this says. The performance of symphonies by Johannes Brahms documented here were recorded with just one single pair of stereo microphones. The sound was cut directly into the master disc via the shortest signal flow at the moment of performance. There was no subsequent processing and therefore no associated faults or copying losses. The process from recording to reproduction was entirely analog. Through the elaborate recording and production process, this edition represents, so to speak, the optimum in analog sound recording. Not only artistically, but also in terms of recording technology and craftsmanship, the present edition holds an outstanding position in the media history of the Berlin Philharmonic. The recordings are released exclusively in this limited edition of 1833, 1,833 copies. The year of Brahms' birth, 1833. I knew it was in the 1830s. Uh, this international version is limited to 1,200 copies. All right, so there's that. Put this aside here. We have, uh, looks like a cellophane or wax paper wrapper with some, uh, oh, are these more session photos? These are high quality session photos. Let's see here. Wow. Is this just one? Okay, so each of these are bundled individually. Some playing in the hall. Yeah, it's a live recording. You see the audience sitting in the back here. Um, they have one of those concert halls where uh, the audience, if there's no choir playing that night, uh, the audience can sit in the choir section too, so you can actually sit behind the orchestra. The hall in Montreal uh, where the OSM plays is built like that too. I often will see the, the Orchestra Symphony de Montreal play sitting behind them. Um, it's a cool perspective. It's more, it's more like what I'm used to hearing on stage than in the audience. Oh, that's a beautiful photograph. Uh, very heavy cardstock. They they kind of went all out with this. Right, here's another. This looks like the, a photo of the uh, cutting lathe. Yes, this is the lathe they set up in the hall. Cool stuff. Now for a moment of truth, the records themselves. Are the pressings good? We'll find out. I'm not going to take them all out. I will take one out. So it's, um, how many LPs is this? I'm guessing it's probably like six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, six LPs for four symphonies, which is about right. So they come in this outer cardboard sleeve, but there's also an inside normal, you know, um, really nice paper with a uh, poly inner sleeve. And, uh, wow. That pressing looks flawless. Um, that is one of the best, you know, 
oftentimes with new records, unless they're pressed at quality record pressing, I know I'm in for a mixed bag, but that pressing looks really good. I don't see any pressing blemishes or quality control blemishes at all. Obviously, you know, that's just this one record, but you know, it's usually a good indicator of how the rest of the set is going to look. So I think I will be very, very happy with this once I take a listen. So I'm going to take a listen. It's probably going to take about a week. And then I'm going to come back and talk a little bit about the performance, talk a little bit about the recording, and talk a little bit about um, some of the other famous Brahms cycles that people have recorded. There's a lot of good Brahms box sets out there. This has stiff competition. So uh, we'll discuss that after I do some listening. Hey VC, so I spent some time with the Brahms box set over the course of a couple days. And uh, I'm gonna spend some time talking about my impressions of this behemoth. So right off the bat, I have to say this is an astounding box set. Um, it's really spectacular. Um, I enjoyed listening to it a great deal. Now that I have that out of the way, I think I need to go into a little more depth in terms of sound quality, in terms of performance, and in terms of uh, comparison to some other recordings, because I know that's what mostly interests people in the market for a Brahms box set. Although, I will say right now, if you want this, um, good luck, because I'm pretty sure it's sold out everywhere. So, um, I don't know what used prices are going for now, but last I checked, they were starting to creep upwards. So if you want this, I'm going to say right now, get it while you can, because the price is only going to go up. Um, and if you find it close to the MSRP, I would say it's worth it. If you find it quite a bit higher than the MSRP, I would say, unless you're a huge collector, it's, it's, it's not worth it. Um, it's going to go for inflated prices. Uh, I guess first I should talk a little bit about performance. Um, you know, these are Brahms Four symphonies. They've been recorded maybe more than any other composer next to the Beethoven symphonies. Um, I think probably the Beethoven symphonies definitely have more recordings out there, but next to that, it's Brahms. Um, there's lots of good Brahms cycles you could get. I'm going to go through a few of my favorite uh, Brahms cycles and uh, select recordings, but first I'm going to give my impressions of the performance of this. And um, so this is obviously Simon Rattle conducting Berlin. I think this was recorded last year. Um, springtime last year is what I remember. And um, it was only recorded for this. It was not recorded digitally or anything like that. Um, so this is a unique performance. It is a live performance, as I mentioned earlier. At the end of each symphony, you will hear the audience clapping. So the performance. Um, I thought the performance was outstanding. Um, in many cases, disappointing in one case. Uh, Symphony 1, 2, and 4 were absolutely superb as far as performance go. I think um, some of the best I've ever heard, especially Symphony Number 2. Um, the recording of Symphony Number 2 was incredible. Um, definitely, I think, the best performance of Symphony 2 that I own. Um, Simon Rattle is kind of a non-intrusive conductor. Um, if you've ever watched him or heard his performances with the Berlin Phil, he gives them a lot of rain, and he's more of a musical spirit guide than a, uh, a tight-reined, tight-fisted conductor like some old-school conductors were and are. Um, this can be an advantage and disadvantage. Uh, I'll talk about the disadvantages in what I heard in Symphony No. 3. But um, as far as the advantages, um, he really lets the orchestra do what they do best, and that is play like a chamber ensemble. Um, the Berlin Phil are one of the most tight-knit ensembles, I think, that exist in the world. Um, in my opinion, they are the best orchestra in the world currently. Um, and uh, they're really one of the few orchestras that plays in a large ensemble like a symphony orchestra, but performs as if they were playing chamber music. And uh, the other orchestra that I think does that really well right now at the moment is Cleveland. Um, and they really always have. But, but Cleveland, both Cleveland and uh, Berlin 
have this sort of sound where everyone's kind of tuned in and playing off each other and really, really communicating at a level that you don't always see. You know, every orchestra, there's going to be chamber-like playing and there's going to be communication. I'm not here sitting here saying that New York or Chicago or San Francisco or Vienna don't play that way. I'm just saying that it comes across much more obviously with Berlin and with Cleveland. And so Berlin's strength is that, and the interlocking parts in the woodwinds and the brass um, really uh, play to their strengths on these recordings. Um, and so for that, I would say these are excellent if you like that style of playing. For me, it's incredible because I get to hear the individual personalities in the orchestra play off one another and really work together um, and I think it works really well for Symphony 1, Symphony 2, and Symphony 4. I did have a slight problem with Symphony 3, um, which happens to be my favorite Brahms symphony. Symphony number no. 3 is my favorite Brahms symphony, because I think it's the most unusual of his works. And uh, the first movement, I think, is, is one of the grandest, most uh, eye-opening movements in all of classical music, the way it just comes together. And uh, at least in my listening, and you know, it's hard to tell how much of it is the recording and how much of it is the performance. Um, in, in this type of medium, you can't really separate the two. But as a listener to me, the first movement of Symphony No. 3 sounded a little jumbled. It didn't quite sound as coherent as I wanted it to. It didn't sound as coherent as I would want it to if I were playing it in an orchestra. Um, I couldn't really... The, the way the parts fit together, they didn't really lock tightly, in my opinion. Um, and again, that's just my opinion. I'm sure someone listening to these might think something different, but I just know it made me a little, uh, it, it made me a little uncomfortable. Um, the performance on the other movements, on the other movements of the symphony were much better, but that first movement of Brahms three just kind of was a little bit unsettling, and maybe that's the effect they were going for, I don't know, but it just sounded, all the parts sounded a little blurred, and I couldn't really tell um, where the line started and stopped, and I don't mean that in a good way, I mean that in a, in a um, it, it felt like some of the times the instruments were a little hesitant taking over each other's lines, or they weren't quite together in passing off musical ideas. And I don't know if that was the fault of the players, the fault of the conductor, the fault of the recording perspective. Um, you know, uh, now talking a little bit about the way these were recorded, um, the one thing I'll say about the recording perspective on this set is that it is string-centric. If you like hearing a lot of woodwinds and a lot of brass in your recordings, um, this might not be for you because the way the, the it's a binaural recording, which I believe simply means they use two microphones and they were placed in the hall so that you get a hall sound. But the hall sound that I got listening on my system seemed to focus on the, on the string section of the orchestra. Um, they were quite a bit louder in the mix than the rest of the ensemble. Um, however, besides that, um, the recording quality was outstanding. The tone was incredibly realistic. I felt like I, I was hearing the Berlin Phil live. Um, I've heard the Berlin Phil play once live uh, at Carnegie Hall when I was living in New York. And I mean, obviously that was incredible and a moving semi-religious experience. Um, but I can confer that, that the sound I heard on my system definitely sounded similar to the Berlin sound that I heard at Carnegie Hall. Obviously, they're playing in a different hall here, but it, it was a, I could tell the orchestral color was the same orchestra, um, and that came across in the recording. Another thing that was really impressive to me about this recording was um, the dynamics. The dynamics were super realistic. Um, very seldom do I hear a recording that really captures the full range of power of an orchestra, um, the full range of tone. Like Sometimes I'll have these big dynamic recordings, um, a lot of these 45 RPM recordings that can do bing, bang, boom, you know, loud thwacks really well, but when they get to the low level stuff, um, it sounds weak or minuscule or, or not quite focused. Um, here, the pianos, the pianissimos, 
are super focused, like you're hearing it live, like you're hearing it close to the stage. Um, not amplified. They don't raise the levels in the soft sections. It, it really is quiet, but it's, it's, the sound is much more focused, if that makes any sense at all. I hope it does. The power of the orchestra really comes through um, in the crescendos. You really hear every little dynamic shift that the orchestra is doing. Um, every little phrase, every little micro phrase, the hairpin um, that each section may do at any given time really come across well on this recording. And when they uh, do get to really big uh, ground sections, um, the sound is not muddy at all. It's very clear. It's very distinct. Um, overall, aside from, aside from the slight preference given to the string section and the way this, this came out, um, other than that, I think the sound quality on this is absolutely superb. Possibly the best sound quality I've heard of any Brahms cycle. Um, so now that I've talked a little bit about both of those things, I want to briefly touch on um, the pressing quality of this set, and then I will, I will go on and talk about some, uh, some recordings to compare it to. Uh, the pressing quality of this set was, uh, initially when I pulled out the first record on the video earlier, I saw a very shiny record and I, I thought, oh, this is going to be very good pressing quality. Um, that wasn't totally accurate. Uh, the pressing quality of this set is good, but it's not outstanding. It's not great. It's not as good as something that would come out of uh, quality record pressings. It's not as good as something that would come out of RTI. Um, I don't know where this was pressed. It might have been pressed at Optimal. It might have been pressed at uh, Palace. One of those two. Uh, but um, I did have some imperfections in the vinyl. In all the symphonies, it was not any distraction whatsoever. Sometimes there'd be a soft tick or something. Um, no big deal. Um, but in the second movement of the third symphony, which is such a shame because it's so beautiful, um, there was a mark, uh, a mark that was missed in quality control, and I've never, I've never encountered a mark like this because um, it was some type of pressing mark, pressing defect, and it didn't cause a sound; it took away sound. It was, um, it was so strange because the, the record would be going and there'd be ba da 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 ba da 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 da. Um, it would like suck the sound away for whatever that little tick was. And I've never, I've never encountered that before. And it was only noticeable for about, I want to say I heard it for about 45 seconds uh, in the second movement of Brahms three, but it really detracted from the listening experience. And, you know, if this wasn't already sold out and I, if I didn't go through hell in a handbasket trying to get a copy of this from Germany, I would return it. Um, I would ask for a different copy. I would, I would say this is unacceptable for a new record. However, I, I mean, good luck trying to get any type of replacement, anything for this. Um, and, you know, one side of, of a 6LP set having that kind of flaw, I'll live with it because I didn't particularly like the performance of Symphony 3 in this set anyway, and I would probably listen to a different recording for that symphony. But for 1, 2, and 4, this would probably be the recording that I turn to. Um, aside from that, though, there was, there was pretty much very little noise. Um, some records would, would, would be perfect. It was, it was surprising the contrast between different, different records in the set. Um, I remember Symphony, Symphony No. 2, um, in, the, in the slow movements of that symphony, I mean, the record was dead quiet. And then I'd get another one, and there'd be, you know, occasional ticks and clicks. Uh, I just, I don't understand, you know, doing a set of this quality and then missing stuff like that in quality control. Um, to me, that's, that's a big reason why I stick with, with stuff from analog productions and, you know, music matters and things like that, because not only do they get good record pressing, good record pressing plants that have good quality control, but they probably do, I, I suspect they do a good bit of quality control on their own. So now that we've talked about this set, which is very good, um, a very excellent set of performances and a very excellent recording quality, 
I wanted to briefly mention some of the other uh, Brahms symphony performances that are in my collection. I've got uh, three other box sets of Brahms symphonies and a couple scattered recordings of different cycles. Um, and so probably the one that is the best sound quality uh, in comparison to all the others that I have is this kind of rare living stereo box set of the Brahms symphonies. I got this about two years ago in Amoeba, at Amoeba Records in Los Angeles. And uh, I'd never seen this before. I knew they released these recordings as single records. I had no idea they made a box set. And this is, of course, all Shaded Dogs. Um, and this is a compilation of, of the four different living stereo Brahms recordings that they did. Uh, there's uh, Carion conducting Vienna, Monteau and Munch doing some of the symphonies with Boston, and then there's one recording of Reiner, Chicago. I don't remember which symphony is which. The performances are generally quite good. Um, Karyan is a great Brahms conductor. Um, Manto is a great conductor, period. So is Reiner, and Munch does a surprisingly good job with these. The performance quality of these is not really up to the Berlin set, but the sound quality rivals it. Um, very good sound quality and generally good performances on these. Um, another set I have that's my kind of go-to middle-of-the-road set um, is the uh, Schulte Brahms, Sh excuse me, Schulte Chicago set uh, on London Decca. Um, for me, you know, I haven't really heard a Schulte Chicago recording that I didn't like. I haven't, you know, they're not all outstanding or excellent, but they're all very good. Um, Schulte was a very exacting conductor and the Chicago Symphony at this time was one of the best orchestras in the world um, you can't really go wrong I don't think the artistry matches that of the Berlin set but it comes very close um, it definitely rivals it and, uh, and London Decca has great sound quality so those two box sets I would also recommend uh, I know the London Decca box set with Schulte can be picked up for, you know, $10, not, not that expensive. Um, you know, you know, if you don't want to shell out the big bucks for this, but you want to hear some good Brahms symphonies, this is a good one. This is a good one to start with. Um, see if you like the music. You know, if you're, if you're not that familiar with classical, see if you like the music. Um, take a plunge, $10, um, won't hurt. And then, uh, then you can explore more recordings. I also have um, a box set on Columbia of uh, George Zell and the Cleveland Orchestra. And as much as I like George Zell and the Cleveland Orchestra, like all of George Zell's recordings, it's a sonic catastrophe. It really is quite bad sounding recording quality wise and mixing quality wise. Um, good performance, great performance actually. Um, Zell was one of the great conductors of the 20th century. The Cleveland Orchestra was and still is one of the greatest orchestras in the world. And they do Brahms very well. They do Brahms in a similar style to the way Berlin does Brahms, um, in a chamber-like fashion. Uh, but it's just, it's Zell, Zell knew nothing about sound recording, and uh, he had ideas that were quite bad about how things should be recorded and how things should be mixed and mastered. And that's why these will never be audiophile recordings. No, no Zell recording on Columbia or Epic will ever sound great. And that's just the real, the sad reality of it. Um, you listen to them for the music only. I almost forgot this one. Um, I hadn't put it in the pile because I had it in the pile to listen to. Um, but this is probably musically my favorite Brahms cycle. Um, this is the best performance and the best interpretation I've ever heard of the Brahms symphonies. And I am talking, of course, about the cycle by Bruno Walter with the Columbia Symphony Orchestra. This, in my opinion, is the best Brahms cycle ever attempted. Um, the musicianship of Bruno Walter and the players that were under him, which is a, which was a, a Columbia contracted orchestra, mostly made up of New York Phil players, from what I can tell, um, is outstanding. And Walter was 
a chief Brahms interpreter, um, one of the best Brahms interpreters. It is on Columbia, though, so it's not going to sound as good as the Berlin set. It's not going to sound as good as the Living Stereo RCA set. It's not going to sound as good as the Decca set. Um, still going to sound better than the Zell Cleveland Orchestra set, but um, this is not an audiophile recording. This is just a good recording. Um, it's a great performance, and I think... For my money, ignoring sound quality, but just talking about performance and interpretation, if I were to only have one Brahms set for the rest of my life, I think I would have to listen to this one. Um, it's just it just hit, it just checks all the boxes in terms of of what I look for in a performance. If I were to play this myself, if I were to see this live, um, it doesn't. Unfortunately, yeah, it's on Columbia. It's not an audio file format. My my box happens to be a 2i set but very clean I, I don't think the previous owner ever played these um this does exist in a 6i set try to find the 6i set if you can um or one of the recordings from that box set from that cycle was issued by classic records in a reissue symphony number no. four and i think if any of them are worth picking up, it's this one. Um, it's not in print anymore because it's classic records and they're out of business, but you can find this seal. Like, I found this sealed on eBay for like 30 bucks. Not terrible pricing. Um, you can probably still find this um, for reasonable prices out there. And it is uh, much better sound quality on this classic records pressing than on the original Columbia. Um, classic records did a good job with the Columbia tapes on these. Uh, a few other recordings I have that I enjoy that are not at the level of the Valter or the um, the Rattle or the Schulte. Um, I quite like Carion for a couple for a couple composers. Um, I like him for Brahms. I like him for Sibelius. I like him for Beethoven. That's pretty much it. But he's uh, Carion's first cycle of the Brahms symphonies on Deutsche Grammophon is quite excellent. And uh, if you can, try to get the uh, the tulip label pressings. I think this is a tulip pressing. Yes, it is. See there? Um, these are just good recordings to have. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely a much, much different sounding Berlin Philharmonic than the one you'll hear on the rattle. But it's, uh, I think it's still excellent. It's a more old school interpretation, and Carion is more exact, much more exacting than Rattle. Carion was a much bigger control freak than than Rattle, um, and so I would say the playing on this is a little more conductor centric and a little more tightly controlled than than what you get in the Rattle box set. But that's a trade off because then you don't really hear the musicians explore with one another as much as you do in the Rattle set. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple more that I have that I really enjoy, just because you know, if you're going to be talking about these symphonies. Um, I have an old uh, Everest recording of St Stokowski conducting the Third Symphony with Houston on uh, the original Everest label. Unfortunately, this hasn't been reissued by anyone, but um, audio quality is decent, uh, but the performance is quite good, especially because uh, Stokowski is one of those conductors that's able to get a high level out of an orchestra that may only be um, a moderately good orchestra. Like, at this time, Houston was not a big-name orchestra. They were not a world-class orchestra. They were a good orchestra, but they were not at the level of Chicago or Berlin or anything like that. But uh, a conductor like Stokowski can bring truly excellent playing out of an orchestra like this, and I think on this recording he does. I also just love anything with the Cleveland Orchestra. Um, and the Cleveland Orchestra's recordings they did in the late 70s with uh, Lorraine Mazal, I think are quite excellent. Um, this is a great recording of Symphony Number no. 2. Don't really like Lorraine Mazal as a conductor. Not my cup of tea. Um, but the playing of the Cleveland Orchestra is so outstanding that I think that makes these recordings special. And the sound quality is quite good. And then uh, 
I only have one of these for Symphony Number no. 1, but these are also worth having if you're a nerd like me and are into historical perspectives. This is a very, very old recording of Toscanini conducting the NBC Symphony in Brahms 1. I wish I had the full set of this, I don't. Um, obviously, these were made in the late 40s, so the sound quality is not high fidelity, really. Um, these are, of course, reissues of what were originally 78s. But uh, there's a reason why Toscanini is still a talked about conductor and still a revered figure in classical music. And that's because he was a master. Quite plain and simple. He was a master that raised the bar of classical music around the world with through his performances and recordings of the NBC Symphony. And so this is a piece of history. And um, no, it's not going to be a high fidelity listening experience. But you're going to be listening to what at that time was possibly the best orchestra playing, uh, best conductor certainly of the probably since you know World War II was a tough time for orchestras. Um, so the 1950s or 1940s, uh, this was the top orchestra in the world. I think in the 1940s, I think that's very safe to say um, under Toscanini. And uh, actually, I'm just seeing now that this was recorded in 1951 in Carnegie Hall. So, actually, the sound quality still not high fidelity, but it's um, you know it's at least into the fifties. So it's the the very tail end of the seventy eight RPM era. So, I hope uh, this was a fun and informative video for you people in the VC. Kind of wondering about this set because I know it was talked about a little bit on Michael Fremer's website. It's been kind of buzzed about in the audiophile press, but I haven't seen anyone in the community actually talk about this or purchase it. So I wanted to give my thoughts on this. I wanted to talk a little bit about how it compares to other recordings, and I, I hope I was not too confusing and gave you a good rundown of some of the options you have out there. You know, bottom line, is this the best Brahms set ever recorded? No, but I don't know if I could name a best Brahms set ever recorded maybe the Valter, but the Valter doesn't have great sound quality. This has great sound quality. Um, but the simple fact that we have a high quality, uh, great sounding set of excellent performances of standard repertoire in an all analog format in 2017, the fact that a major orchestra undertook this, I think that's huge. This is a great piece of what I hope becomes a renewed interest in major orchestras in recording not only in analog, but just in good sound quality in general. Um, you know, for so long in the 90s and the 2000s, orchestral recording quality was so depressingly blah. Um, I mean, really, I mean, they were just... Uh, some of the recordings I have from the 90s are just not pleasant to listen to. Um, and not because of the musicianship because of the recording quality. And this is such a breath of fresh air for people like me who are modern classical musicians who, you know, sometimes don't want to listen to old playing styles all the time, want to listen to what people are doing now. And uh, it's never enjoyable, usually, because the recording quality is, is subpar in a hi-fi system. Well, this solves that. And... Um, I really, really hope that Berlin and other orchestras like this do projects like this in the future. You know, maybe it doesn't have to be direct-to-disc. Maybe direct-to-disc was extreme, but it's just at least an all-analog recording once in a while, just for the nerds, it will sell. Like, these sold out. These are sold out. They sold every one of these they wanted to. It's not like they're not going to sell. They're going to sell. I hope this is not the last product like this I will have a chance to get in my lifetime. So I hope you enjoyed this VC. Um, it was really, truly a joy to listen to such great music by such a great orchestra in such a great recording. It wasn't work at all. This was not work. Do let me know if any of you have heard this box set. Um, I'd love to hear your impressions on it. I know not, not a ton of people have picked it up and the classical community in the YouTube VC is not huge, but it would be interesting to hear someone else's impressions on this set. And I think that's all for me. Thanks, VC.